So thank you everybody for joining us for the May uh, developer call. Um, and also it so happens to be May the 4th. So may the 4th be with you. Um, just a quick reminder that um, this meeting will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. So um, if you would not like to be recorded, uh, you can hop off now. Um, to get things started, uh, let's go through the list of announcements. Uh, KubeCon Edge Day uh, was today and as well as KubeCon Europe uh, for the next couple of days. Uh, we had our KubeCon Edge Day talk today, uh, this morning, and we'll also be giving a talk on Acri, uh in two days on uh, Thursday at 3.25 uh, a.m. Pacific time. Uh, please drop in for that um, if any of you are attending KubeCon. Um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a great time. So going down through the agenda, the first item we have is our uh, really, really big uh, version 0.6.5 release. Um, I'll hand it over to Kate to talk about that. Great. Um, Edric, do you mind pulling up our release notes um, and sharing that? Yep. Do you want the GitHub one? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and then just to follow up on the KubeCon events, um, I believe that those will all be posted to CNCF's YouTube channel on May 14th. So. If you cannot attend, um, you should still be able to see our both our lightning talk from Edge Day and also our, um, our main uh, conference session. Um, and that session does cover um, some one of our main new features that's in this release, and that is our new discovery handler um, extensibility model. We've talked about it in our past community meetings, but it's finally merged into main. Um, and well, it's finally a part of our, um, our release. And what this means is that you can now um, implement discovery handlers in any language. Um, they, it just has to implement our gRPC interface, which is um, described as a proto file. And you can run these discovery handlers separately in their own pods. Um, by default, our Helm chart deploys them as a daemon set. So um, now on every worker node in your cluster, you'll have the agent running there and every discovery handler that you want. Um, so instead of having an agent that's supported UDEV, ONVIF, and OPC UA for a local device discovery, IP camera discovery, and industrial device discovery, um, all in your agent when maybe you only needed to discover some USB cameras. Now you can be specific and say, hey, I only want these discovery handlers deployed, which means the agent's smaller. It doesn't have as big of an attack service. Uh, we don't have to expose it to the network for ONVIF, for example. Um, and um, you can deploy these discovery handlers and then remove them when you no longer need to discover um, those devices. So it really um, makes Aukri more plug and play um, and extensible in the sense of say you had some uh, new protocol that you wanted to Aukri to support, um, such as ZeroConf that really um, in the past, it would have really blown up the size of the agent. Um, now that it can run its own discovery handler and it's not floating the size of, size of Aukri's core components um, for everyone. So, um, and a note on this is people who um, enjoyed the past experience of one agent instead of agent and discovery handler on each node, you can still use this old image that supports um, our current three discovery handlers, namely UDEV, ONVIF, and OPC UA by specifying agent um, full is true in, when installing Aukri. Um, and then also uh, we've tried to make our make files fairly descriptive so that say um, you want to build an agent that only supports two of these discovery handlers and embed that. Um, you can also do that with our make files and then deploy your own agent image using our Helm chart. And then furthermore with that, um, if you are a discovery handler developer and you want to support your discovery handler being embedded in the agent. Um, so if someone wants to customize an agent build that has your discovery handler, you will need to implement your discovery handler in Rust then so that it can be compiled in with that agent. Otherwise, if that's not something you want to support, feel free to do it in any language of your choosing. Um, that's just something to note. And the current way that um, we call those embedded discovery handlers, if they can optionally be added into the agent. Um, and then additionally, um, the way that currently our three supported discovery handlers are organized in our repository is that they have a library where most of their functionality is, and then a separate um, directory for um, utilizing that library for um, the external discovery handler, and then the internal one, if it's embedded, can just point to the library. So that's how we've designed it currently to promote like 100% code sharing of the actual discovery functionality. 
So something to keep in mind if you do want to implement a Rust discovery handler that can be embedded in the agent. Um, and of course, this is a really fast run through. We also have documentation on discovery handler development that is now um, a part of our docs. And um, there's also additional documentation on broker development, which we haven't had in the past. So um, that's also something to look at if you want. Remember, brokers are those workloads that utilize discovered devices. So we really, in this release, also released a lot of documentation. I'm going to pause here before I keep going with all the other features of this release to see if anybody has any questions on all of that that I just um, spewed out. OK, then I'm going to keep going. Um, so that was the biggest uh, release. Also, biggest part of this release. Another big part of this release was um, we have a webhook for validating our configurations. So it'll make sure that instead of um, just our serializing, um, validating our configurations within our agent and conf uh, controller, we have a webhook that will check that that configuration is the expected format before it is even applied to our cluster. Um, so that really will help um, tighten um, our scenarios. And then we also have support for monitoring Aukri's agent um, and controller using Prometheus. Um, and the currently exposed metrics that we have are number of instances and number of brokers, I believe. And we did it in a way so that if you want to support more uh, metrics in the agent controller, just put in a PR with the metrics that you want to support. It's pretty descriptive since we already have those exposed, that service exposing the metrics in each of those two components. So it would just be adding um, spots within the code for aggregating and incrementing whatever metric that may be. And then finally, a fun one, um, or our, our other big one is that um, we have an Aukri logo officially out. Um, you probably have seen it for a while, but um, it's um, design is, all the designs have been merged into or were put into this release as well. Um, so that's also exciting. We have this art folder with all these um, that contain all the different uh, layouts of our logo. So whether it's horizontal or stacked and um, there was thought that went into the, the lettering um, that maybe Edric can talk a little bit more about, but that was certainly a fun part of the release. And if you're interested in all the bug fixes and the tidbits and the DevOps optimizations that also went into this release, definitely check out the release notes. Um, and this also kind of gets to our next topic of, this was a lot um, that went into one release and um, really is incentivizing a process that we should now proceed with where we can release more frequently. Um, so I guess with that, I'll pass it off to Brian to speak a little bit about how we can um, maybe make this cycle of releasing more regular and talk a little bit about what should go next into our next release. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I think uh, for sure we want to have a more regular cadence of releases. Uh, I think we got uh, uh, a big, big chunk of functionality in there last time because that took a little bit of time. Our release was spaced out a little bit and ended up with a lot of features, a lot of stuff in it. Um, but I think uh, from a generally engineering perspective, you know, uh, a more frequent, smaller releases is, is, are better. Uh, maybe every month sort of thing, I think is what we might ideally have. Um, but it gets to kind of questions about what people might like to see in a next release. Uh, uh, we've certainly got issues and things like that that we can just sort of work through a backlog uh, as we come to them, but that sort of neglects any any attempt at prioritization from, I don't know, a strategic point of view or a, uh, uh, other than somebody just picking up an issue and solving it sort of perspective. Someone going, ooh, that you know strikes my fancy. Uh, so we thought we'd open it up on some level in sort of a free form what are some things that people might find interesting? Uh, I know from my mind, I like the idea, you know, of getting this working on Windows or maybe some of the other uh, Kubernetes platforms out there, you know, taking a, another swing at getting it working on K-Zeros or something like that. Uh, we certainly have on-viv improvements that, that are needed. Uh, 
you know, infrastructure can always get better. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, the most entertaining thing or like the thing that drives people, but it's certainly something that can keep people from contributing um, and making it making life harder. Uh, you know, there's always improvements to documentation or format, things like that. Um, and of course, the thing that'll really, I think, drive usage is how do we get more discovery handlers, uh, more brokers out there? Uh, so I don't know. Uh, does anyone have opinions as to what sounds like uh, a good direction or what might be a, a good thing to put into the next release? Um, I will say I'm, I'm partial to um, working on furthering our ONVIF scenario, um, getting support of IPv6 uh, cameras, um, putting some thought into authentication scenarios for that. How do we pass unique user password pairs to each broker that needs to authenticate with the camera it's supposed to interface with? Um, that's one that I'm particularly interested in. Um, but the brainstorming that authentication scenario is something that um, we certainly can do amongst us, but it would be great to get even more community interaction on what that scenario would best look like. Um, are those credentials ever shared or do um, cameras have the same user password pairs or are they all unique? Um, so that, that's, and how frequently are people using IP cameras that require authentication? Rather, are they just using private networks that they don't feel like they need to authenticate their cameras. So I think that would be, um, I would think that would be interesting to look further into, um, I think adding support for more platforms like K0's kind, um, Cube Edge, I think would be cool to look at. Uh, it's not simple, uh, but that would also be cool. Um, so those are my first thoughts. Yeah, I think those are all good ones. Uh, as you were talking, I, I thought about Onviv's broker size too, uh, and wondering if there's a way to sort of manage that down. Um, I think I, if I can add something, um, if I remember, during uh, when I was writing my thesis, I was uh, making some end to end tests. And um, I thought that uh, maybe it would be useful to allow configuration on the, um, I don't know if it has uh, been changed uh, uh, in the last month, but uh, I don't think it's possible to configure uh, the period uh, of the uh, discovery handle, is it right? Uh, for instance, then it's a, I think it's a specific uh, interval, uh, periodic interval at which the <coughs> discovery and uh, uh, tries to discover new devices. Is it configurable? And maybe uh, we should think about also a different strategy than just uh, periodically checking if uh, there are new devices. Uh, I got this issue because uh, uh, I was testing how the, the system would work when uh, a device, uh, the device goes offline. And I just noticed that it, I have just to uh, wait until the next uh, uh, period I mean. and uh, that up that is not ideal I mean you have to decide uh, a value for the period which is usually unknown for most of the systems because you cannot predict, predict uh, how much uh, the best value is. I mean if it is too low you uh, put pressure on the devices for instance on my on my uh, make a controller I had uh, uh, I started to notice uh, um, buffer overflows <laughs> uh, because the device received too many requests from all the different uh, uh, nodes on the cluster because since there is also uh, different uh, agent per node in the cluster my device was receiving too many requests uh, discovery requests and uh, I started also to experience race condition uh, despite uh, uh, having the runtime uh, written in Rust. <laughs> and uh, so I noticed this uh, issue. And in general, I think uh, uh, we should start to think about um, the uh, different strategy to discover devices I mean, instead of just using a periodic timer. Yeah, um, I remember we talked a little bit about this. Uh, that makes sense that you can't determine an exact period 
uh, to check over and over again. So the decision of how long to wait in between checks or to even do a checking type of system is on the discovery handler. So I don't know if co-op, if you need to check or if the, like what the best way to look would be mm -hmm. for that. Um, but that is on the discovery handler. So okay. that's not unique to Ocre anymore. Um, for UDEV, ONVIF, and OPC, I believe it's a 10 minute, uh, a 10 second uh, loop um, because we took the previous model and put it in the current model. Um, but uh, for co-op, I'm not sure what that would be. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so it, uh, it, I think it, uh, it's good that it's on the discovery handler to choose the best strategy based on the protocol. Yeah, because it's okay. um, the agent will just call discover on the discovery handler, and then it's up to the discovery handler to periodically pass information back whenever it, it sees. It only will, or at least for um, our three current ones, they only update the agent when something changes. Okay, cool. Uh, on a similar note, is there anything that Agri could uh, uh, do to help uh, developers? I mean, in uh, the case the device goes offline and uh, you must support availability. I mean, um, for instance, I was thinking about uh, uh, when a device goes offline, it is, if it is temporary, uh, it could make sense to just uh, wait for it to go back. And in that case, the, there is the broker, in my case, with Copa, uh, who is able to use the cache and the data strategy. But in other cases, if the uh, device goes offline permanently, it would make more sense to uh, provide a, a different device be, without the, uh, the application, uh, uh, without this uh, un, being noticed, noticed by the application. And I was wondering if uh, uh, such support for availability uh, should be just uh, developed by the discovery handler or if there's anything that the Acre could help to, uh, I mean, with this issue. Yeah, um, I think that could be more configurable. Uh, right now, the way Acre handles that is since we have this um, binary of are you a shared device or a not shared device, mm -hmm. for devices that are unshared, like local devices, if it goes offline, um, the, the, if the discovery handler says, hey, agent, this device no longer exists, the agent immediately deletes that instance, the controller will immediately remove the associated broker. However, if it's a shared device, so oftentimes network-based devices where intermittent connectivity is expected, um, Ocre gives it a five minute grace period. However, that's not configurable. And when I say Ocre, okay. I mean the agent. So it's on the agent, not the discovery handler. Um, but I could see like what you're saying, that should be more specific. So maybe when you make your configuration, you say, oh, I expect the type of devices that are going to be discovered by this co-op discovery handler to have intermittent connectivity, but not anything more than two minutes. And so it'd be great for you to be able to configure that. And then the agent would only delete the instance once uh, the discovery handler hasn't said that device is online again after two minutes. Okay. Is that kind of the scenario you were thinking or what? Yeah, I think that uh, surely helps. Uh, but I was thinking maybe we should open an issue and discuss about it with more time. I was thinking about some more high level uh, uh, help from uh, Acre uh, to also provision a new, um, or at least find, uh, look for a new device while, while waiting for the old one to go back. Because you, in the real case scenario, I think you don't know if the device will ever go back. And uh, that puts, uh, uh, I mean, in my opinion, a nice uh, use case to think about uh, uh, about what is the best strategy to deal with such cases. Are you saying yeah. um, give the broker a different device while the first device is offline? Yes, yes. For instance, uh, uh, if the device is going back, uh, uh, deleting the broker, would be uh, would, wouldn't be wise, <laughs> and for instance, uh, you would lose the uh, lose the cash, and so in some other case, at, at the same time, it would be uh, the best uh, solution because the device isn't going back uh, anymore. So uh, maybe we should I think open the issue and uh, discuss it with more time. 
about uh, possible strategy and about, and about what uh, can actually do to help uh, uh, in general every uh, discovery protocol and what is uh, what should be left to the specific uh, protocol uh, yeah yeah i think it makes a lot of sense to add a add an issue and sort of starting a conversation here as to whether it makes sense to uh, make this a configuration at the Acri level mm -hmm. so that Acri has to come out, has to have a set of strategies that apply accurately across a broad range of devices and device types versus having a discovery handler um, come up with its best, the best strategy for the devices it's discovering yeah. and tackle it that way. If there needs to be configuration then that configuration can be plumbed through the uh, configuration details it expects or the discovery details it expects to come through from the configuration. Uh, is on one level, it's hard to imagine coming up with the right strategies for mm -hmm. everyone uh, and coding that into Acri versus uh, finding a nice way to plumb it through from the configuration to the discovery handler and allow discovery handlers to kind of go, well, I know I'm a network device that is frequently offline. So if I don't see this device, maybe I won't report it back as offline until I've seen it offline for two minutes or something. But I think uh, an issue makes a lot of sense to get this started as a concept and kind of find a good solution for it. Mm -hmm. Giovanni, would you be interested in crafting up that issue um, since you've kind of laid out the thought process of it pretty well? Uh, <laughs> okay, yes, so I don't think I laid it very well. I think uh, Brian explained it much better. And <laughs> thank you, Brian, for <laughs> explaining it better than me. But uh, yes, uh, I'll open uh, the issue and uh, try to <laughs> organize the ideas better. Cool. And then I think you also brought up something when you were saying the caching of your broker that I think would be interesting to discuss is how do we manage um, state in our brokers? Um, and right now we kind of have this uh, assumption that all of our brokers are stateless. And what if um, a device, like you were saying, goes offline? Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of goes along with this discussion, like we need the grace period to be or sometimes people are going to want longer grace periods because their brokers are stateful and um, how do we handle that scenario? Yeah, I think uh, in a self, by doing a bit of self-promotion, uh, I wrote something about uh, caching on the tables that I sent you. Um, if I remember correctly, caching is important uh, uh, to avoid uh, uh, stressing the device too much and to, uh, to allow scaling on a certain perspective because you can have multiple applications uh, uh, using the same the, the data from the same device without uh, all of them connecting directly to the device. And that is also helped a lot by the broker. But at the same time, caching is not always the right uh, solution because uh, oh, um, you will have stale data. And uh, for certain types of uh, information, you want to have the uh, most recent data and not uh, you cannot have uh, Mm, something that is uh, even maybe 10 seconds old or something like that. But on the stateness uh, point, uh, that is also worth to discuss because usually stateless uh, architectures are more scalable because uh, preserving the state uh, is uh, more difficult for scaling, but also state is very useful for applications. Uh, so I agree that is also um, a good topic uh, to discuss more about. I guess to bring us back, so we obviously those are issues that we can think about solving too, and we need some input from the community on as well. But I think we should also go back to um kind of the originator of this discussion is what what should we do next we've talked about these mm -hmm. um issues that uh are happening but um if we say we want to have a release in a month like what do we want to go into that release i 
And I think that maybe the framing of that could be what of all the things is most important to you, right? Um, and I think knowing that would help us sort of craft a strategy. And I guess I'm um, following up on that. Is this something that maybe we come up with a list and then can put in the Slack afterwards and see what people want to thumbs up the most or um, how do we pull for what is important? Because obviously we can't speak on behalf of everyone. I think the Slack idea sounds great, Kate. Um, is it, uh, I think it's a weird question though. Uh, um, isn't there a general product direction? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, at least in my experience, a bit unusual to ask the community to decide on it. I mean, we are not deciding that to vote for the most important features. Usually, uh, it, now that I think about it, in uh, TypeScript, uh, they usually have uh, uh, they usually pick the most voted issues on the repository. So the more the if there are some issues and a lot of people are voting, it it surely means that it's uh, quite part of the community, and they try I think to find a good compromise between what is the uh, the direction from uh, the Microsoft perspective and what is the, the com what are the community wishes so that um, uh, you don't lose the project direction by following only the community uh, guidance but at the same time you uh, keep uh, an eye on uh, what uh, the community would like to have. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think you've, you've nailed it there. Uh, I think that's certainly what we're keeping in mind as well. Uh, but we'd really like, you know, outside of having an established pattern of people voting on issues or anything like that, uh, you know, we're in early days. So we're trying to give as much opportunity to everyone who's here to, to have that voice uh, in the meeting here. Barring that, we certainly default to what we find to be interesting in the direction that we want and uh, the issues on the list that like we look at and it uh, and we say, oh, yeah, we need to fix those for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we are certainly interested in amplifying the voice of the people that are interested now. Uh, so we appreciate your feedback and that's we're really, really just kind of giving you the opportunity to be like, this is the thing that's really bugging me and I'd love to see it fixed. And then we would certainly prioritize that. But barring that, we can certainly do the look at the, the issues lists and, you know, organize that according to our vision for the product and come up with a, a set of manageable items for the next release. And I think we've certainly gotten lots of good, good new ideas here, or maybe not necessarily new. I think you and Kate have discussed a lot of these previously, but certainly put them out there and we can uh, build that into the list and come up with a, a release for next month. Uh, I think maybe uh, GitHub issues are also more accessible to anyone interested in the project because not sure. everyone is on Slack, uh, especially on community Slacks like Kubernetes. I don't I think it's a logical way to go about it too, right? Upvotes help you understand what's uh, what's important as far as issues go. And maybe we can build that into the documentation that, that describes our sort of general plan for development, uh, takes that into account as far as what we do next, mm -hmm. reinforce that as a strategy. Yeah. Uh, for you say, in my case, I would like to see the roadmap for the 
for the project uh, just also to see uh, what is the uh, your direction for this uh, project and also to be excited for what's coming next points yeah i think we could um we have a roadmap document like document but i think it's something we could be updating it kind of has a large vision of um more discovery handlers and more deployment strategies uh which is basically expand scenarios um in use mm -hmm. cases uh which i think is a good vision but i think it can also have there can be a lot more to it. So like expand platforms and expand security um, support and uh, stuff along that line too. Yeah, um, uh, so on, yeah. on that note, maybe the topic about uh, trying to uh, also think about, uh, as I said before, uh, should accurate also help with availability with the caching strategy and so uh, try to understand the, um, the position of the in the bigger in the bigger picture of the whole uh, distributed system uh, what's its uh, role and uh, so it's not just supporting technical more protocols but also just like a kubernetes does uh, uh, to help with developers uh, develop uh, of edge application and uh, on, on yeah and for that scope what is necessary to be accomplished by Acre. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we can definitely have some more vision there on what is Aukri the part, like what hole is Aukri a part of and having some more scenarios fleshed out and in our documentation. Yeah, um, I would love to. Awesome. Well, I think we've uh, definitely discussed um, a lot of different options for um, next release cycle. And it sounds like some action items out of this are for those uh, options we talked about, like Aukri and more platforms, create an issue for that. Um, better more robust Envis support create one issue for that since we have multiple and um uh what we were talking about with um discovery handler um i guess how when it's going to decide a device is offline um kind of those kind of decision makings that's another issue um and if there are, maybe after this we'll put some up and then if there are any missing or i guess if anyone's watching this and comes up with uh things they would like prioritize the next release also create an issue for that. And we can choose one of those to tackle uh, one or more depending on the time we have. Yeah, so I think the the, uh, the next thing on the agenda is uh, with Edric there. Do you wanna take over Edric and start talking about the documentation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Kate and I have been working on a documentation site uh, for a while now, although it has gotten a little bit um, stale lately, uh, just hasn't been updated too much. Um, so we're really trying to push uh, for having it uh, updated soon. Um, so currently our documentation is um, hosted in the GitHub. Um, we eventually kind of want to migrate it to a live site. Um, I'm currently sharing my screen that shows kind of a preview of what it might look like. Um, this is currently hosting uh, documentation from a little bit while back, um, but um, to give you guys a little bit of an idea of what it might look like uh, when it goes live. Um, eventually, we want this to, to be a standalone website that hosts all the documentation. Uh, however, all the all the content of it will actually be backed by um, will be backed by either GitHub repo or the docs folder within the main Aukri repo. Um, I think um, the direction that we originally thought about was uh, basically having all the markdown files um, hosted in the slash docs folder in the Aukri repo um, so that when uh, developers do PRs, um, they can update both the documentation as well as uh, the PR at the same time. So when you put in the PR, um, the documentation is rolled in together in the whole, um, in the whole bundle. Um, does anybody have thoughts on that? Um, certain projects will, will do it that way. Um, with other projects, they'll also uh, kind of separate out the, separate out the website. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to maintain the website, but at the same time, uh, for developers who are trying to update documentation, um, it requires them to basically go to two different repos um, and uh, update two separate places when they put in, uh, put in PRs. 
I think it may make sense for uh, these kinds of projects which are on early stage to have the documentation on the same repository. And uh, generally, uh, I really like the idea of having a website. I didn't think about it, but I really like it. <laughs> I think it makes the documentation much more accessible. And uh, when I was uh, making the pull request, I uh, had to uh, search for the different files in the repository, uh, which is uh, worse than having just the website and uh, the table of contents on the left. <laughs> Um, yeah. I think that's a good point because um, this can always be this decision can be pivoted later. So we currently have all of our docs in a docs folder. Why don't we host a site based off that um, as we grow and our repository gets bigger? Maybe we then break it into its own repository. But um, if we're prioritizing getting this site up now, then we should just point to where our docs currently are. Mm -hmm. Um, so overall, I think, um, yeah, that's a good approach to it. Um, and we'll roll this in into the next release um, so that by the next release, uh, we'll have this website up and standing on its own uh, domain. Um, so anytime we need to point uh, folks to documentation, we can point them to the website and all of it will be there. All right. Um, if there's no more comments about the website, I'll pass it over to Brian for uh, issue triaging. Um, let me make you the host um, so you can do uh, screen sharing. The host. Yes. All right, let me just pull up the, uh, the issues here. Sorry. Let's see. I updated it with all of the latest issues. Awesome. Yeah, let's see, how do I share this bad boy? Um, share screen to that bright green guy there. Everyone see? Or anyone see? Okay, good. Uh, okay, so let's see. We've got uh, include Ocri configuration instances in cube control get all. Uh, I think we've already got this being a good first issue and an enhancement. Uh, I, I think it should go right in the backlog. Um, so yeah, that sounds have, good. Feedback. I think that it'd be pretty awesome to see it and get and get all. I don't know if everyone feels that way. Uh, increased dependency versions were not covered by auto update. Uh, Kate, do you want to describe this? Yeah. So we have a workflow that'll auto update our dependencies. I believe once every month. Is that correct, Roa? Yeah, that's correct. And it'll bump the, it will never bump the highest version of it. So it follows Semver. So um, it won't bump the major version if that's the highest level version or the minor version if that's the highest level version. And so we were thinking before a release, uh, going through and what hasn't been bumped, uh, try and bump it and see if it requires further changes. And in this past release, there were a few that required some ad additional code changes along with the bump. And so that needs to be done separately. Um, and so this issue is just to go and do that. And it also points to a larger issue of updating our, um, our async crates, um, in particular, our Tokyo version, which of several other crates are dependent on that need to be updated as well. To me, that sounds like an important thing, <laughs> or at least a worthwhile thing. I, uh, knowing how quickly the async code can change and how hard it is to make a drastic update. You know, yeah, I wonder if this makes more sense. Yeah, I wonder if this issue um, that's possibly going to be created every release should be one that should be closed by the next release. Um, I feel like that would be a good goal. Uh, but obviously, this has a lot that's built up to it. Um, okay. 
but that would be um, great. Do we have a way to automate this or is this a real manual process? It's pretty manual at this point. All right. Maybe it'd be pretty cool if we could come up with a workflow that um, uh, updated these things, ran on a, a release, right? And then, you know, it just basically triggered the tests, right? The builds and the tests. And uh, we could check out like, you know, and then you've got a kind of an idea for the next release cycle. You've got, okay, we've got these things that we need to work, th work through the details of. Um, but uh, I think it sounds like a backlog item. Uh, yeah. Um, not sure about first be, or not. Because um, we have a bunch of dependencies there, right? Some will probably not require a lot of changes and some might require dramatical changes maybe. Um, I was just curious if we should put it as investigating first because we need somebody to investigate and maybe create like one or four issues or probably just, I don't know. Um, like it seems like multiple issues baked into one. Yeah, so I would say this is a good first issue for all except the third, the fourth bullet there. Um, from my preliminary look at them, uh, the other ones require a few changes. I'm actually, I have a PR in for the fifth bullet there. That was simple. Um, they actually could have just been bumped, but um, the fourth one has its own issue already created. Um, so I don't know, does it become not a good first issue because the fourth bullet is not a good first issue? That's certainly what I was zeroing in on in my head. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, maybe we break this out into um, an issue per, I mean, I, I think there's two things here, right? There's these particular issues that we can work on. And then there's the concept of every release, we should check and see, are there like updates to, <clears throat> updates to the latest version of anything? And if we just updated all of them, would things work or would things break? Um, yeah, having some workflow or script to run that tries to update the top level version of all of these and sees which ones require further changes and then makes an issue for that would be great. Yeah, just my guess, just since I looked at that before, 99% uh, or 90% of the cases, you're going to require some changes because major version updates is a breaking change. Um, so I, like, I think what I'm trying to say is it's going to be a little bit complicated to implement that, but I'm not sure it's going to pay off. Uh, but yeah, definitely worth at least somebody to take a look at and see um, if that works. Yeah, and I was thinking that that wouldn't be like imagine a workflow that ran after we re did a release, right? So you create a release, it runs, it just updates all these things, tries to build and run the tests, right? And just basically, if there's any failures in that, it creates an issue saying, hey, we need to resolve this for the next release. And there's lots of ways you could resolve it, right? You could resolve it by saying, we're not going to do it. You could resolve it by actually updating the code. You could, you know, um, whatever, it would just sort of be kind of a, an indicator to us, hey, this is work for the next release cycle. Yeah, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is you have multiple dependencies and the best way to do this is you wanna update only one dependency at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you, the chances if you update all of them the, to the major version, you 99% you're gonna fail to build. Um, so like the best way to do this workflow is you wanna update just a single dependency uh, to the major version, build and see if that works and then pick the next dependency and so on. Um, so it's it's gonna be like a combination of kind of all the dependencies we have. Um, but yeah, again, it's a, a fun investigation that somebody can pick. <laughs> that's a good point, Roa, because from personal experience, that's exactly how I personally went about that. Um, yeah, but and that's why I would build. expect, I mean, I'm sort of looking at it as more of like TDD, right? So here's your test, it's failing, make it pass. Uh, not the expectation that it would magically work and we wouldn't have any work for the next release. That I didn't think would happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but cool, uh, it sounds like um, I think at the very least um, investigation to like maybe break some of these, the things that are currently referenced into uh, separate items. Uh, and it sounds like Kate, you've got a pull request for several of them. 
um, and we can, I think, maybe pull the good first issue off it for now, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I personally like it all in one issue um, because it's hard to know when you covered it all if it's multiple. Uh, but that's my personal preference. And another thing to note here is that this does not include, like I mentioned at the bottom of the issue, any of our Python or .NET. Um, I haven't inspected any of those applications. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pull the label, I think, uh, or at least try to. It looks like that wasn't the thing to click. <laughs> um, let's see here. Open. Open says me. Uh, there we go. Um, and then move it, I think, to investigating for now, and we can figure out how to best create uh, a, this is something to do now, and this is something to do later issue mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we've got our periodic failures in micro So um, It's all of them now. <laughs> Kubernetes too? Yep. I got it once. Interesting. Uh, and this is, uh, we think it's, it's new. Um, did we, is our test, do they run on a specific version of uh, Ubuntu or are we just using Ubuntu latest? And maybe they switched, bunch, yeah, they switched it to 20.04, maybe 20.10. They switched it recently, so maybe that correlated. Maybe we need to like specifically be on the previous version. Where they had, I didn't even think about uh, that. They offered more resources or something in the, the test runners. Um, yeah. Uh, this it sounds like it needs investigation uh, and it needs fixing, but it sounds like it's had a bunch of investigation too. Yeah, to provide uh, some background for others. Um, our end-to-end -end tests will periodically fail. You might get, since we run a matrix of uh, like seven Kubernetes versions on three different distros, like, so it's running 21 times. Sometimes that'll fail on one, uh, one of those like distros um, and version combinations, which means your whole, all your tests go red because that one time the runner ran out of memory. And some of the fixes we've done for this is uh, reducing in Kubelet the um, eviction limits for memory and CPU and lowering that as low as possible so that it'll run with very little left, um, but still sometimes it's occurring. So um, that can be time consuming because you can't just rerun that one. You have to rerun the whole, what, 40 minute to an hour long test. So this would be just great. To, first. Yeah, this would be great to get, get fixed. Agreed. Uh, so I'm going to move that over to investigation. I think uh, we need to figure out what's going wrong there. Um, and here we've got uh, IPv6 camera, uh, our ACRI implementation, and uh, wanting it to work with IPv6. I think that uh, it's definitely something that that would be good. Uh, in addition to authentication, is that somewhere else? Um, I believe that's an old issue. Uh, okay, somewhere. We already knew about it. All right. Uh, so just in the backlog, you think? Um, yeah. yeah. righty. There's our triage. Hey. Awesome. All righty. Um, so with that, um, I guess the last thing that's on the um, list of things to do is uh, assignment for uh, next month's meeting. Um, do we have any volunteers for any of the any of the roles? I'll just barge in guys since I missed out the last meeting. I'm, I, I'm dedicating this month in order to get up some some form of let's say lab up and running. So we've got um, a bunch of uh, Raspberry Pis, and we've been planning to create like clustering lab over here at, at my place at, at work. And uh, we actually plan to use um, 
whatever's out there in terms of, for example, edge computing, and uh, we have Acre on our, so to say, backlogs. So I'll keep you guys updated if there are actually some form of problems in terms of uh, deploying something or maybe getting the word out. So my 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 current aim at this point of time is still there's one issue regarding uh, MQTT that's still open. I think it's been open for quite a while now. So I'll, I'll be dedicating my time and resources in trying to figure out if we can actually come up with some something useful for that can be integrated with Acre. So that's pretty much it from at least from my side. I do have other other things too. So I work on a different some certain aspects of a research where we've been because of the current pandemic we haven't had um, access to actual systems. So we've, we've tried to quote unquote emulate and simulate some things in the industrial floor. So for example, um, instead of a heavy heavy robotic arm. We've just tried to, let's say, create some some form of two-dimensional robots that, that can publish some form of data to, to a, let's say, highly available broker. In this in instance, it'd be RabbitMQ or something. But we'll try to see if that, that, that kind of thing actually passes with the project and probably get your opinions about it. It's still like in a pretty early early stage as of right now. So we've just been figuring out how we can actually bring this on uh, to the table with you guys, the main developers at, at Acre. So yeah, uh, things since uh, things might get pretty much clear over the upcoming uh, upcoming weeks or so, I'll, I'll get, keep you guys posted. Maybe maybe it might be quite interesting from. From what Brian and uh, Giovanni were mentioning is like how we can, for example, leverage the the framework that you guys have developed into something practical. So, for example, I can help you out with docs, um, maybe give you some feedbacks regarding what works out for for us and what doesn't work out for us. So, uh, it's like I said, uh, the most interesting part, at least for us, is is like like the the big the big name protocol that actually stay, stands out for, for industrial application at this point of time is first OPC UA, which is already there. But the other one that dominates at least on in, in our um, group is MQTT. So we'll have to, like I said, I'll keep you guys posted about how, how things might probably might work out in terms of uh, integrating MQTT brokers with Acre. So that's, yeah. That's pretty much it from my side. Yeah, that sounds good. Definitely keep us posted. And um, since this is ending soon, it might be good to talk offline as well because um, the functionality of the OPC UA discovery handler can definitely be expanded in certain aspects. And so it'd be good to know exactly what your scenarios are currently, like authentication scenarios and also discovery scenarios, like whether or not you're using local discovery servers or not. Um, so that we can make sure that it fits your needs currently, um, or if that should be something that's prioritized as well. Yep, sounds good. Uh, so like I said, uh, I won't be working too much on the OPC UA discovery handlers per se, because uh, currently we don't have uh, a lab that can do this kind of things for us, but uh, as in like a simulation or an emulation tool that we have on the table that doesn't talk in terms of uh, OPC UA, but I'll, I'll see if I can bring something for, for you guys in terms of that discovery handler too. Because I think that that MQTT might be might be something that that maybe we as a group should should work on because it's it's quite catching up at least at this at this point of our research in general. Like we've been working with that protocol persistently for the past X years, and then X is more than three for us. And um, it's also been picking up quite a lot on other, so to say, open source foundations like Eclipse and Apache, and it might be interesting for you guys to have a look and probably work things out. Um, yeah. So we will work together. I'll, I'll hopefully keep it po keep you guys posted on Slack, and then we'll take it from there. Sounds good. Um, on the roles. Um... I can do issue triage next time. You can put me there. Sounds good. I can take notes. I think I can moderate then. <laughs> cool. All right. So with that, um, 
Thank you again, everybody, for joining. And I guess we'll see you at the first Tuesday of next month. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.